Please be seated, everyone. I want to invite you this morning to turn with me to Psalm 19. It's Psalm 19 this morning. Psalm 19, that's where we're going to be picking up as we continue our, our work through the Psalms. So Psalm 19. We as human beings, as mankind, we, we are explorers. We want to see what's over the horizon. We want to seek out new knowledge, new understanding of, of our environment and, and, and what is around us. We are the individuals who would craft rafts and tie them together and explore the archipelagos of Southeast Asia. We are the ones that put sails on ships and discovered the new world. We are the ones who climbed to the top of the highest mountain and stood on both poles. We are the ones who would send probes out into the deepest reaches of our solar system and even beyond that. We have stood on the moon. We love to explore. In the words of my favorite explorer, Buzz Lightyear, our motto is to infinity and beyond. We are explorers. We like to explore. Now this morning, Psalm number 19 speaks to that, that desire within us that we have to explore and to increase our knowledge base. This Psalm tells us the final frontier, as it will, where we go for ultimate knowledge. So we have opened in front of us Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving its chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the ends of the heavens and its circuit is to the end of them and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous all together. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Now who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Now, in our Psalter, in our book of Psalms, there are 150 of these Psalms. But even amongst those 150, there are a handful that really stand out. They stand out for the beauty of their poetry. They stand out for what they say to us about God, for their imagery. They stand out for the way they have been used in Christian worship for centuries now. Uh, Psalm 23 is one of these, the Lord is my shepherd, one very familiar to us. Psalm 19, the one we have just read, that's another one of these spectacular five-star psalms that really stands out to us. This is one of those psalms that actually can be taught in literature classes by secular professors, such as the beauty of what it says and the way in which it says it. 
Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about how this psalm is beautiful and, 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 and how it, 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 it proclaims what it proclaims, uh, but we'll do so in service of, of what the Lord is teaching us through this psalm. So we'll begin here in verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. So here in the very first verse of this psalm, we see a, an aspect of Hebrew poetry called parallelism. Now, when we have a poem in English, we often have the ends of the lines rhyme. Uh, Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Yeah, it rhymes, right? It rhymes. Um, in Hebrew, the poetry doesn't rhyme by sound, it rhymes by what it says, the message. So here in verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, the sky above proclaims its handiwork. It's really the same idea expressed in different words. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord, the sky proclaims his handiwork. It's the same idea, right? Expressed in different words. So we see it here at the beginning of the psalm, we see it when we get to verse 7, when it talks about the law of the Lord is perfect. Uh, it's going to go on to say the same thing, the law of the Lord is perfect, but in a bunch of different ways over the next two or three verses. This is Hebrew parallelism. Now, why do I point this out to you? This isn't a literature class, okay? Well, here's why. God gave us his word, which is frankly what a lot of this psalm is about, and he tells us to take his word and to share it with the nations around us. Well, in order to share it with the nations around us, what do we have to do? We have to translate it, right? And Hebrew poetry, the, the, the poetry that we see in the Psalms, that we see in the prophets, it is eminently translatable because what we are translating are thoughts and not sounds. Sounds would be different in each language, right? But the thoughts the thoughts are the same. It's amazing that, that when God chose a language to reveal himself in, he, he chose a language that is easy to translate to other languages. Now, that's one aspect of this psalm. Uh, we see this parallelism in other psalms, but this is a, a great example of it. Uh, the, the author here, David, uses this parallelism to great effect, making it very beautiful to read and to hear. There's another aspect of this psalm that, that I hope you noticed as we went through it. Uh, it's written in three parts. There is a first part that talks about God as creator. There's a second part that talks about his word, starting there in verse 7. And then there's a third part which talks about the psalmist, David, and, and the hearers, ours, reaction to uh, the first part and the second part of this psalm. So we have part one, part two, and then part three, which is our reaction. That also leads to some beauty here. So let's take a look at part one. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, <clears throat> and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out throughout all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from one end of the heavens, and its circuit is to the other end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. So here's the first section of the psalm, and here David is talking about the glory of God's creation, the heavens, the stars, and all of that, the sun that comes up in the morning that goes across the sky throughout the day. Uh, think about what David did for a living before he became a king. He was what? He was a shepherd, right? Shepherds spend their lives outside with the sheep. They are up and they feel the sun all day long. And then at night, they light a fire. And in that arid climate, the temperature would drop rapidly. And there's nothing to do after the sun goes down except lie on your back and look at the stars. Now, we don't really do this that much anymore. We, we live inside and, and we turn the air conditioning on and we turn the heat on at the other time of the year. And if we're to see the stars or if we're to see the sunrise, we really have to make a special effort to do this kind of thing. But sometimes we do this. Uh, usually it's during the summer when we're on vacation. 
and we'll go out to a lake or to the beach or so forth, and we'll seek out these opportunities. Now, there have been times when I have been amazed at the stars that the Lord has put in the night sky. I remember one specifically, I was uh, standing on the edge of a cliff overlooking the Pacific Ocean, and there was nothing between me and Japan except for water. And there, dark as can be, I could see the Milky Way up above me, like an arc going across the sky. And the arc of the Milky Way gave its color to the ocean beneath it. And it looked like the Milky Way was pouring down into the Pacific Ocean and filling it up. That's just the way it looked. It was the same color. It was amazing. It was an incredible sight. I remember another time that I was high up in the Rocky Mountains at about 12,000 feet, uh, camping out, bivouacking, I guess, between two very prominent peaks there. And the stars were just, uh, it, it, it looked like you could reach out and grab. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn were both out at that time. And it looks like they were just jewels that you could reach out and pluck from the sky and, and put in your pocket. And what was even more amazing about that time is it was in a saddle in between two peaks. There was a peak to the north and a peak to the south, and they blocked out sections of the, of the night sky. But to the east and the west, there was nothing. The, uh, the, the mountain fell off about 5,000 feet in, in each direction. Uh, and so you could see to the horizon both ways. And it appeared, and I know this is just an optical illusion, but it appeared to me that following the stars all the way down to the horizon, those stars were actually below where I was. I don't think that's really, you know, true. I mean, uh, but but it, it, it appeared that way. It appeared that I was standing on the shoulder of a giant who had thrust my head up into the stars, and the stars were actually below me. It was an incredible sight. Have you ever been somewhere where you have seen the night sky like that, gone camping somewhere out where it's dark and, and really studied what God has created? Well, David has. And what David is saying is that the very night sky declares God is Lord. He has created. Creation is good praise God. This is what all the stars are saying when they twinkle, okay? Now, what happens at sunrise? The sun comes up, uh, and, and when the sun comes up, we now have this new light that God has given us, and it can be incredible too. That time that I was up high in, in the Rocky Mountains, um, we were on the side of a mountain, and when the sun came up in the east, it hit the mountain that we were on the side of, and it cast this perfect pyramid of a shadow to the west, all the way to the horizon. This shadow of the mountain caused by the sun looked like it was covering all of the state of Idaho. It was incredible. I remember another occasion when I was on Smith Island, which is in Maryland, but, but really it's it's its own world. It's in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay. And when I say island, it's a collection of mud and grass that sticks about three inches up out of the Chesapeake Bay. If you spit, you would sink the whole thing, okay? But people have lived there, watermen who, who go and get uh, oysters and crabs and so forth, and they've been in this insular community for hundreds of years, and so they speak with what sounds like a British accent. It's almost like uh, hearing Charles Dickens' world come to life when, when you're there. Uh, we, we stayed at a Victorian house where there's a bed and breakfast, uh, and there's no trees or hardly any trees. It's, it's mostly just low grass and structures, uh, houses and, and piers and so forth. Well, in this house, when the sun came up, there was nothing to block the sun. There were no trees, there were no buildings, there was nothing. So the sun came up and it came directly into our window like a laser. You're not sleeping through the sunrise on Smith Island. And I remember talking to the innkeeper afterwards and telling him that, yep, we got up at 536 when the sun got up or whatever time it was. And he said, oh yeah, here the sun comes up like thunder. Have you had experiences like that? Maybe going to the beach to see the sunrise or, or, or so forth. It is amazing. And when the sun rises and when the sun sets, 
what we are told is it is declaring the glory of its creator. It is saying, praise God, praise God, praise God. Every waterfall as it rushes over the brink is crying out, praise God. Every star that twinkles, every bird song that we hear in the woods, every rustling of leaves during a thunderstorm, the peals of thunder, the crash of the lightning, it all cries out, praise God, praise God, praise God. This is what Psalm 19 is telling us. That's the first section. And then we have this pause and this dramatic shift to the section sec the second section, excuse me, that begins in verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. Now, we've been talking about God and his creation, uh, and I've described to you some of the experiences that I've had, and I know that you're thinking now some of the experiences that you have. Um, one of the things that we as human beings are good at in our, in our quest for knowledge and our spirit of discovery, we're good at building instruments that help us to discover what is around us. I have a small telescope, about yay big. Um, I don't really know how to use it very well, but I tinker around with it from time to time. But I remember the first time I was able to image Jupiter in this small telescope. I was blown away. I could see the disk of the planet, and I could even see some of the bands of the atmosphere there in Jupiter. It was amazing. I remember the first time that I saw Saturn in my telescope. Now, Saturn is really far away, um, and so it's tiny. Even, even in a telescope, it's tiny. But you could see the rings. Couldn't see the individual rings, but you could see that there's a ring, and you could see the, the disk of the planet. I, I was blown away. It was amazing. Um, we have built instruments that we have put into space that we can see so far back into time and so far across the galaxy that it, it, in, it improves our knowledge of this universe that we live in. And, and on the other side, we have built super colliders, particle accelerators that are so large uh, that they, that, that there's one in Europe that, that crosses over boundaries from Switzerland into France, it's so big. And we accelerate subatomic particles so fast. And then when they collide, we, 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 we watch to see what happens to increase our knowledge of the subatomic universe. Uh, we can do this with the instruments. However, there is a limit to what we can discover with our instruments. We can, we can know that there is a creator, but we can't really learn much about that creator. Think about it this way. If you have a painting by a painter, you can tell that the painter used particular pigments, uh, you could tell that the painter perhaps used particular kinds of brushes or, or kinds of brush strokes, uh, particular kinds of paints and so forth. But that's really about the limit of what we can learn about the artist from looking at the painting. Such it is with God. God is outside of what he has created, like an artist is outside of the painting, like a potter would be outside of the pot that is crafted. For God, uh, you know, excuse me, for us to learn more about God than that he is a creator, we need help. We need him to reveal himself to us in an extra special way. And that's what David is reflecting on when the Psalms shifts from part one to part two, from verse six to verse seven. The law of the Lord is perfect. Now, the word law here is, is Torah. And we talked about what Torah means when we took a look at the first psalm uh, a number of weeks ago. I'll refresh your memory. Torah can mean the first five books of the Old Testament. It can also be kind of a catch-all phrase for the entirety of the Old Testament, the entirety of Scripture. Jesus would refer to uh, Scripture, the Old Testament, uh, as the law and the prophets, Torah and, and the prophets. It's kind of this catch-all phrase. But its, its definition is instruction or, or teaching. That's really what it means. And that's how David is using it here. The instruction 
the teaching of the Lord is perfect. Now, another thing I want to point out to you is that in verse 7, David shifts how he addresses God. Look at verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. In our English translations, we have the word God there. Verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect. It's not God anymore, it's Lord. And if you look closely at your English translation, probably the word Lord is spelled in capital letters. All four letters are capitalized. That's an indication of the Hebrew word that's used there. Okay, so back to verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The Hebrew word used here that is translated God in our Bible is the word El. El, we would transliterate that E-L, okay? And it is a generic term for God. So in Hebrew, they could use El to mean God Almighty who created all things like David uses here in Psalm 19. They could also use it to speak of a pagan God like a god of the Canaanites, like the god of thunder that the Canaanites worship, a a pagan god, or the god of the Nile that the Egyptians worship. Now, we use our English word God in a similar manner. It can mean God who we address our prayers to. It can also be used when we are talking about uh, a pagan god, a a god of thunder. Uh, I am the god of the internet. I'm sure people have said that kind of thing before. You see how that's used? It's kind of a generic word for God. So when David is talking about God's creation, he uses the generic word L for God. When he gets to verse 7 and he starts talking about God's instruction, his teaching, he uses a different word. The word translated in our Bibles as Lord, all capital letters, is the name Yahweh. So every time in your English Bible that you see Lord spelled out in capital letters like that, it is a translation of the divine name Yahweh. Now this name, Yahweh, it is very specific. It refers only to Almighty God. It doesn't refer, it can't be used for any other like pagan gods or or, or what have you or any kind of generic or general sense like that, it is a proper name. And it is given to us by God. It was given to Moses in the burning bush. You'll recall in the book of Exodus, uh, God appears to Moses in a in a divine sign, this, this bush that is burning. It is, it is being consumed by fire, but doesn't burn up. And he says to Moses, I have called you to act as my instrument. I'm going to send you to Egypt. You are going to appear to Pharaoh, and you are going to command him to let my people, the children of Israel, go. And Moses doesn't want to do this, of course. God tells him he has to do it. He's going to do it. Moses then says to God, God, when I go, and speak to your people, the Israelites. And when I go and speak to Pharaoh, who shall I say is sending me? What's your name, in other words, is what he's asking. And God says to Moses, my name is Yahweh. And Yahweh translated means I am that I am, I will be that I will be. I was that I was. It's really the verb for being. It is I am, written in all capital letters across the sky. That's God's personal name. And the point is, Moses would not know this name unless God gave it to him. There's no way that Moses would have known this about God, his name. Now, he would walk outside, look at the trees, hear the birds, smell the grass, and know there must be a creator. Just as David, out there with the sheep, would see the stars in the heavens, would would see the beauty of the shade underneath a tree, would see the sun come up and the sunset, and know that there must be a creator God. But there's no way that either of them or any of us would know God's name unless he gave it to us, unless he revealed it to us in a special way. And that's what David is talking about in the second part of the psalm. 
all should know that there is a creator God because of creation. But God, he goes beyond that. He goes beyond the ability of our instruments to define him and to image him. He reveals himself to us in his Torah, his law, his instruction, his guidance, his counsel, his word. And so as we press the envelope of human knowledge, and as we build instruments and place them in the heavens or collide particles here on earth, as we seek to push knowledge farther and farther out, we'll learn incredible things, but we will always be limited. We will know that there must be a God, but we won't know anything about him unless, my friends, we pick this up. It is here in his Torah, his instruction, his guidance, his counsel, that God reveals himself to us. And this is what David is singing about in this psalm. Verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, Rejoicing the heart, the command of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Don't we feel guilty sometimes living in the world around us? It can be a filthy, ugly place. But here we are told that the fear of God, recognizing that he has spoken to us and hearing what he says that is clean. Don't you want to be clean? It endures forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Verse 10, they are more to be desired than gold, even much fine gold. They are sweeter than honey, the drippings of the honeycomb. David the poet is singing out, praising God, because God speaks to us that we may know him, because otherwise we wouldn't. Otherwise we wouldn't. Verse 11, Moreover, by them your servant is warned, in keeping them there is great reward. We are warned against actions that can be fatal to us, can be destructive to ourselves and others. And we are told that to hear what God says in his word and to take it to heart bestows upon us a blessing and a great reward. So this is what David is excited about. This is what he's singing about. And so we have section one of the psalm that praises God for his creation and says that really all of his creation is praising God. And then we have section two, which says that God doesn't stop there, that he actually tells us directly about himself. He reveals himself to us in a very special way through his, through his word, through his teaching. And that brings us to this third section, the section in which David, the psalmist, invites us to reflect on these two great truths. And, and what is David's reflection? Verse 12, who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. David stands before God's creation and is ashamed of himself because he knows he's a sinner. David hears God speak and David is ashamed of himself because he knows that he cannot, he's not worthy of hearing the very words of God. And so David's response is our response. God, make me clean, that I'm worthy to hear your words. Make me clean so that I can be a part of your good creation. I'm sure that Psalm 19 was very much in the mind of the Apostle Paul as he sat in Ephesus and under the overwhelming influence of the Holy Spirit crafted 
the letter to the Romans that we have in the New Testament. In Romans chapter 1, Paul tells us that God has made himself known to every single human being who has ever lived. Every single human being, and I'm paraphrasing here from Romans chapter 1, can walk outside the door, can look up at the beauty of the sky, can hear the birds singing, can see the beautiful leafy trees, and know that there must be a creator God. It's hardwired into all of us, and truly nothing else makes sense. And yet, we are also told in Romans chapter 1, We choose to ignore this great truth and turn our backs on Creator God. And because of that, we have fallen into all kind of sin, and this world is broken. This is the message that we see in Romans chapter 1. God's creation declares Him. We refuse to acknowledge it, and we turn to sin instead. And that's why the world is such a mess. Now, in Romans chapter 8, Psalm 19 is is still on Paul's mind. And he declares that all of creation is groaning, even now, waiting impatiently for the moment that Jesus will come back, that he will claim his followers as his own, and all will be set right. So earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, flash floods, wildfires, all these things are example of creation created by God, groaning and crying out, Lord Jesus, come. Set it all right. Save your followers and put all of creation at peace. And this is what David is crying out at the end of this psalm. God, I'm guilty, and I know it. I'm guilty of sins I know about. I'm guilty of messing up when I don't even know it. And people have to point it out to me, and I get angry with them. Save me from such things. Clean me up that I may hear you when you speak, and I may be a part of your creation that is pleasing to you. Verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is his great prayer. And what a great way to win a prayer. May all of me be worthy of you. How can this be? How can this be? We all mess up. We are all fallen. We all hurt people when we do not intend to and and do things when we shouldn't, and don't do things when we know we should? How can the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in the sight of Creator God? Well, only when God is our rock and our Redeemer can this happen. Because God has revealed Himself to us in His instruction, in His Torah. But that instruction that word of God finds its ultimate form in the gift of his son. Jesus, the very word of God, came to us to show us who God is, to reveal him perfectly to us, to tell us things about God we would have never figured out on our own, no matter how powerful our instruments became. And then he died for our sake hanging on the tree, bearing our sin, doing what we couldn't do, being a perfect substitute for us. And then he rose again and invites us to be a part of life and life eternal, giving us the very Spirit of God and bringing us into God's family. Jesus is the one who makes Psalm 19 work. He does. And praise God for him. So all of creation cries out the glory of God as you travel this summer and as you go to the beach or the lake or wherever you go. Take those moments. Go out, look at the stars. Hear what they say. They are crying out, God reigns. 
When you go to the beach and you see the sunrise, hear what it is saying. It is saying, God is Lord. And reflect on his very gift to us. His name, himself, his image, his son. That we can know him and know about the purpose of life, something we would never figure out on our own. I invite you this summer to take an opportunity to do that. And men, because it's Father's Day, I invite you as you're out on the links and you can smell the grass and hear the sprinklers and look at the beautiful trees. Or if you're standing in the middle of a creek with your pole in one hand, reflect on how all of God's creation declares him. And yet he has shared with us even more than that. Now, it is Father's Day. And so I want to close this morning with a little coda to this sermon. And we find it from a companion psalm. This is Psalm 78. Now, Psalm 78 is a very long psalm. We're not going to go through all of it. I'm just going to read the first handful of verses. What this psalm tells us is that what the Lord has shared with us, that he has created everything, and that furthermore, he speaks to us through his word, and that his son has come to die for us and to grant us life in him. All of these things are not for us to hoard, but we are to share them, fathers, with the next generation. So Psalm 78, the first handful of verses. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children, but tell them to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. God has created and God has revealed himself to us. God has saved us. And we are to tell that to the next generation. Would you pray with me? Almighty Father God, we praise you for all that you have done. We praise you for creating, for creating the heavens and the earth, and for creating us down to every molecule and every atom. Father God, we thank you that even though your creation declares your presence and your glory, you didn't stop there, but you shared with us your true person, your divine name, and your image, and your very son, yourself. And in a very personal way, he died in our place that we may be clean, and we thank you for this. And Lord, if there are those who are here this morning who have never latched on to that great gift, never taken hold of it, I pray that you would guide them to do that just now be they in this room or be they visiting uh, or being a part of us via the, the live stream, Lord. And Father, I thank you for sharing all of that with us. And Father, I thank you for the mission and the, and the calling that you have given to us, uh, made aware this morning especially because it is the day that we celebrate fatherhood, that we are to pass this great truth and the means of discovery on to the next generation. And so, Father, I pray for the wisdom and the devotion to do just that. It is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, that we pray. Amen.